powerful verbs. Hey nerds, welcome back. My name is Nicole McEwen and I need a haircut really badly. <laughs> now that we've gotten that out of the way, in this part of the editing tips series, we are going to be talking about powerful verbs and why you should use them. Editing for strong verbs is something that you can do when you get to the stage of editing where you're looking at paragraphs and sentences specifically. Don't worry about this when you're still looking at broad story issues like character arcs or plot issues. Focus on the big stuff first and then work your way down to the smaller details. Verbs should be something that comes later on in the editing process when you're looking at sentences specifically. Why do we need to do a round of editing focused particularly on verbs? Well, you don't have to do a round of edits just for verbs, but this should be something that you do when you're looking at the way your sentences and paragraphs sound, if they're communicating the way you want them to, and whether or not your word, you should <laughs> word usage is really giving your sentences the power that they need to draw the reader into the story and give the reader a strong, vivid mental image of what's going on. But again, why? Why are we looking at verbs specifically? Well, we're looking at verbs because they imbue your writing with life. They show what is happening to these characters that you're trying to get the reader to love. Not only do they tell us what is happening, but they can also tell us how things are done. And if you're using the right verb, they can give the reader a strong idea of how something is happening without adding extra word count by using things like adverbs. This is not an attack on adverbs, okay? I personally love some adverbs, although I do try to control their usage, and this is a fantastic way to do that. A great verb, the right verb, can drop your word count, it can make your sentences cleaner, it can give a vivid and accurate mental picture of what's happening in the story. And that is why you need them. To start out, let's create a sentence that's very simple, and then we'll modify those verbs by adding some adverbs, and then we'll change the verbs up completely, and we'll try a few different verbs and see how they alter the way the sentence comes across. She ran across the field and jumped over the fence. Pretty simple. Now let's add some adverbs. She ran quickly across the field and jumped nimbly over the fence. Again, pretty simply, but now we have a little bit more of a mental picture of what happened. We also have an increased word count. So let's try changing those verbs entirely and see how they change the sentence. She sprinted across the field and vaulted over the fence. Even without any additional descriptor, the word sprinted carries with it a kind of driving urgency that the word run just doesn't have. Because of the nature of words, even synonyms that you might be able to use interchangeably will have different connotations. So we know that we have a female, and we know that we have her crossing a field, and we know that we have her going over a fence. Let's choose some different verbs and see how those alter how we feel about what she's doing. She hurried across the field and climbed over the fence. She trudged across the field and clambered over the fence. She pounded across the field and flew over the fence. The first sentence doesn't quite have the same sense of urgency as it did when we used the words sprinted and vaulted, but it does give us the feeling that maybe she's got something important to do. In the second sentence, trudged carries with it this feeling of sad but determined forward motion, and clambered also has a feeling of clumsiness to it. So the whole feeling of the sentence has changed. Now there's not the same sense of urgency. Now she could be moving forward because someone has forced her to, and she just is not very thrilled about it. And in the final sentence, I'm using an uncommon verb to communicate the way that she's moving. The kind of cool thing about using a word like pounded is that it gives us a sense of the feeling of her movement, not just a mental image of how she's doing it, but a kind of visceral feeling. If you think about the sound of the word, it is a two-syllable word and it has these plosives in both syllables, so it kind of is reminiscent of a foot striking the ground, if you think about it pounded, that plosive pound and t, so pounded. And then if you look at it within the structure of the sentence, you'll actually see that there's a rhythm that's created there that is reminiscent of running feet. Pounded across the field. You can almost hear and feel her feet striking the earth and that vibration resonating up her legs. So using words this way, even sometimes irregular verbs, can not only increase the clarity of the mental image that you give your reader, but it also can give them a visceral feeling about the sentence. 
When you're careful about verb choice this way, not just thinking about what the word means, but thinking about the feeling and the sound of the word, then you're thinking like a poet. Which is kind of awesome because if anybody can get across really visceral feelings in a short amount of time, it is a poet. If you want to read an example of somebody who has done this beautifully, who has chosen words not just for what they mean, but for the sound and the rhythm of them, then read The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe. If you've ever heard the word tintabulation somewhere else other than this poem, I will give you five bucks. No, I won't really give you five bucks, but my point will have been proven. Now, not all uncommon verbs can be used this way. You can't just stick any verb in a sentence and hope that it works. You have to choose one that makes sense within the content of the sentence, but also one that the reader will be able to understand refers to whatever it is you're trying to show. If the word is too far off from something that the reader recognizes, then they're going to notice it and instead of giving them a strong, vivid mental image and visceral reaction, they're just going to reread the word and go, what does this mean? A couple of examples. She slumped across the field. She flicked across the field. As you can see, the words still need to be make sense even if they are used in an irregular way. Slumped is used too often to refer to posture, and flicked is used too often to refer to hand gestures for it to make sense to use it in a way that somebody is moving across an open space. An irregular verb that could work really well in this scenario would be sloshed. She sloshed across the field. The reason this could work is that it is close to another word that we use when we're talking about walking, which is slogged, but it also has specifically to do with water for the most part. So when you use she sloshed across the field, then that gives the reader this feeling of wet mud where you're just kind of splashing and just flicking gunk with every step. This is a perfect time for you to use a thesaurus. So if you come across a verb that is just kind of a weak dull verb that's not really pulling its weight or giving a good sense of what's happening and you cannot come up with a better verb that makes more impact on your own, then grab a thesaurus, thesaurus? Grab a thesaurus and see if you can find one that really perfectly conveys the sense that you're trying to get across to the reader. Now please do not change every single verb you come across. Just like with any part of good writing, this needs to be done purposefully. Make sure you consider what it is you want the reader to understand about the sentence. Do you want to communicate to the reader a sense of fear, urgency, joy, determination? Do you want the reader to focus on the movement of the running, or the emotion of the character, or the reason that the character is running. I realize that this is getting pretty in-depth talking about something that may seem as simple as verbs, but these are things that you can consider when you're looking at a sentence and you realize that you need to change the verb, and it can help direct you in choosing which verb you want. So let's say that we want to focus on the reason the woman is running across the field. We could say, she fled across the field. That obviously gives us a really strong image of why she is doing what she's doing. She is running from something. She is fleeing. So clearly, something bad is going on on the other side of that field. Instead, let's say we wanted to focus on the actual motion of running itself. We could say, she loped across the field. This doesn't tell us why she's running, and it doesn't give us any sense of anything other than the motion of her gait. Just to really drive this point home, I want you guys to try something. So write yourself a simple sentence and include some strong verbs in there. Then write down what those verbs imply about the backstory that led the character to that exact moment of your sentence. Once you've done that, flip them around for a few different verbs and see if the picture changes. This is a great way to drive home how powerful these little verbs can be. Now, in the editing process, as I mentioned before, I would not recommend starting off with looking for these verbs. When we talked about filter words and filler words, I mentioned that those would come later on in the editing process, and it's gonna be the same for changing out your verbs. On your first round, you really should be focusing on nothing more than big picture issues like plot and character arc, plot holes, things like that. 
when you start getting down to the little details, the sentence level details, the word level details, that's when you want to look at things like changing your verbs. When you give this a try, I think you're going to be surprised at how much more powerful your writing is going to become and how much more visual and visceral it will feel to the reader. Hey nerds, thanks for hanging out for this next part of the editing tips series. If you find the content helpful, I would love it if you would like this video and if you're not already subscribed, please do that. Also remember the next book in the Eververse Chronicles trilogy, The Founding Lie is launching August 16th. It's so close. And so you can order any copy of the book on pre-order now. I will leave all of the links below, but if you do decide to pre-order, I want to give you a gift. Take a screenshot of your receipt, email it to me at author at gmail.com, and I will send you the first five chapters of the book just to get you through until your book is delivered. And if you're within the continental United States, I would love to send you an additional goodie. I have keychains, I have bookmarks, I have digital art, I have signed copies of the book, I have all kinds of goodies, but I can only send those to readers within the continental United States. So if you would like to be surprised with one of these gifts, just send your shipping address along with your receipt to Nicole McEwen author at gmail.com and I will be sending you a surprise goodie. Don't forget to like and subscribe and until this Friday, be wonderful.